surger and, and gave them away as Christmas presents. Yeah. That was just cute because you can have all kinds of mix, mix and matchies, which is fun. <laughs> which clock are we going by? That one? Huh? <laughs> Mine says four right now. Oop, I don't have glasses on. No wonder I can't see. There you go. I know. I know over here. Yeah, I'll have you hold this. <laughs> and Karen's, my colleagues are all teaching lab. And they're like, oh, try to get over there. <laughs> they go, it's okay. Because I teach. Because fall term I teach. And spring term I teach, so I can make them. Oh, there's Bonnie, and Tony's made it. Good turnout. I guess so. Gather at the wagons. Welcome. Oh, gosh, I'm really loud. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know I was that loud. Um, I want to welcome you to our first colloquium of winter term. Thank you so much for coming in the first week of classes. I know this is a tough time for everyone, so it's great to see so many people here. Um, I am Rhonda Fritz. I'm in a faculty in the College of Education, and I get the honor and privilege of introducing today Dr. Laura Mark. So let me tell you a little bit about her background, and um, then she can take it away from there. And after she is finished with her presentation, we will probably have time for some questions, so um, keep that in mind. Um, so Laura received her BS in biology from Augusta College in Augusta, Georgia, and in her words, way back way in 1988. 1988. <laughs> <laughs> she also received an MS in evolutionary ecology from Southeastern Louisiana University in 1990, where she got to study the feeding preferences of newborn checkered garter snakes. Everybody loves a baby, even <laughs> snakes, right? Yes. Um, she also received her PhD in behavioral ecology in 1995 from New Mexico State University, and there she studied the territorial behavior of female tree lizards. She came to EOU in 1995 and has been here ever since. Yep, straight out of grad school. Awesome. <laughs> She says when she's not teaching biology courses, she can be found chasing Columbia spotted frogs or birding at Lad Marsh. Or at the sea ponds. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, take it away. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is a nice turnout. So what I'm gonna talk about today is, uh, I call my talk a bird in hand. This is the uh, establishment of a MAPS research station out at Lad Marsh Wildlife Area. So I have to give you a little preference. In uh, 2017, Scott Van Holt uh, from Friends of Lad Marsh sent out an email and asked, does anybody want to learn how to ban songbirds? Uh, we want to do a songbird course. And that was early in the year. And uh, I said, of course I do. So in August of 2017, me and seven other uh, area biology, biologists, got together and we had a course uh, to learn how to band songbirds. It was a week-long course in August out at our marsh where every day uh, from roughly 5.30 to 11-ish, we banded birds, then we had lunch, then we had lecture from about noon to four, and then we had homework every single night. And so this was an intense workshop. The hardest thing I think I've ever done, uh, maybe it was just sleep deprived. My, my banding people are here, they understand. But when we got finished, we said, this is so much fun, we wanna do this again. So we went through the process to establish our map station. So this is our first year. When you establish a map station, they want you to run it for a minimum of 10 years. So I'll be back in 10 years uh, to talk about what we uh, have done. So this is just to give you the idea of what we do as crazy biologists. So MAPS. MAPS stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. It's supported by the Institution 
of um, the Institute of Bird Population. And the MAPS agency, or the MAPS program, is one of the many, many agencies uh, along uh, with the Institute of uh, Bird Populations that banned birds and record the information associated with the, the banded bird. All of our data goes to the USGS uh, Federal Bird Banding. I guess it's a library. I don't know what you would call it. Uh, so to, if anybody catches one of our birds that we have banded, they can report it and we will get that information. So the MATS program is one of them. There's dozens of these different programs. And each has their own protocol and different uh, reasons for banding birds. So one of the things that the MAPS does, so it's a collaborative um, effort. It's among public agencies, non-governmental groups, and anybody who's interested in assisting the um, conservation of birds and their habitat. It started in 1989, and there's uh, well over a thousand map stations, uh, pretty much in every state uh, and in Canada. And they have recorded more than two million bird uh, records. So here is just a screenshot from the maps uh, site. Uh, the green dots are active map sites. The pink dots are no longer active. If you zoom in, you can see our lovely green dot. We're so proud of that green dot. Because uh, it wasn't on their page for a very long time. It just showed up. So you can see we're the only map station uh, in Eastern Oregon. The pink dots, these are old stations that ran um, in 1992 to 2008. Uh, these were run by the Forest Service, I believe. Um, there are other agencies that are banding birds, but this is just the map station. So it's been roughly 10 years since uh, there's been map data from our area. So what does maps data provide? So the one thing that maps are interested in is looking at bird populations, particularly bird populations are declining. And so the data that we collect from misnetting the birds we can try to solve some of the problems or see where the problems are. So where are the problems the worst? Is it the breeding grounds or is it in the non-breeding grounds? Um, are there differences? Do we see some uh, trends between particular regions or different habitats? Um, what are some of the relationships that are out there between population change and the weather, the climate, and habitat loss? Climate change is one of the big things that is really driving avian um, population declines. Uh, projects in Europe, they have these long-term studies where they're looking at migratory birds, and with climate change, birds are migrating two to three weeks earlier than when they're supposed to. But unfortunately, the plants and the insects aren't keeping up. So birds are showing up to the breeding ground not having food. And so this is one of the main problems. In Hawaii, if you've been to Hawaii, there are no native Hawaiian birds in the low elevation. Because when white men came, they brought mosquitoes. And mosquitoes carry the um, avian malaria. The mosquitoes pretty much wiped out all the native birds and the native birds are only in the higher elevations because the uh, mosquito can't survive there. But as we're seeing climate change, the mosquitoes are moving higher up the mountains and the birds don't have any more place to go. So these are things that are driving um, these uh, declines. And so what can we do um, uh, with this data and hopefully come up with some ideas to reverse the decline? Um, so the programs that are um, working today um, are basically counting and estimating the numbers of birds. And so we can track their population sizes. So recapture birds, you can do um, mathematical 
numerical computations to get estimates from population size. So map stations are helping us understand populations. And these estimates are useful, but they are limited because we don't know all the underlying causes. Uh, and the other aspect about um, these um, population uh, data is that it gives us information about the life stages of birds. So what stage of life is most important in limiting the population growth? Is it the adults not surviving, the adults not reproducing, the offspring not surviving? So that's some of the information that maps stations are giving. So again, why is it important? And so some of the key demographic um, parameters that they're looking for is productivity, recruitment, and survivorship. So productivity, are the adults coming? Are they breeding? Are they productive? Recruitment, are they making offspring? How many offspring um, are they producing? And are those offspring surviving? So these are the parameters that we're looking at. Uh, other banding um, agencies may be more interested and in have their area set up in migratory areas. And so, but MAPS is more interested in the populations. So, does it work or how does it work? So, the way that it works is all MAPS stations that are established all use the same protocol. Um, and we use a fine. Um, mesh nets to capture the birds, and we're interested in birds in the nesting season. So we wait long enough to capture the migrants that come into the area, or what we call some of our resident birds as they come into the area, and we're interested in their breeding. So other banding are interested in who's coming through. We did get, we do get some interesting migrants that we were quite surprised about late in the season that made absolutely no sense, but that data will come later. So stations are run by independent banders, state, federal, and U.S. government personnel, or under the IBP uh, contract. Uh, we ban the birds. We collect information on their age, sex, body condition, and reproductive status. And then each bird is given a lightweight aluminum leg tag, and we release them unharmed. And then recapture data uh, will give us that information on survivorship. If somebody else catches our bird in their nets, uh, if we catch our birds again, we can get information on reproductive rates and some movement patterns. So this is how it's working. So let's get into the fun stuff. So, our map station is located here, out at Lad Marsh. So here's Hot Lake, cruise down Hot Lake, past the RV park. This area is called the host site, and we bumpy down this very washboardy, sometimes underwater road to our map station. So pay attention to that little lake pond. So here's the close up of our map station. Uh, it covers about 23 acres, so we get in our 10,000 steps every time we run, don't we? <laughs> my, my crew's here, so they, they know. Um, we set up 10 nets, and we have a centralized banding station. We, when we set up the nets, it was mostly uh, Scott Finholt, uh, Kathy Nowak sort of went out there and scouted the area and came up with some ideas. So we're along Lad Creek here, so we have a little riparian corridor, um, shrubby riparian, so we have three nets along there. Then we have three nets along this kind of scrubby, um, uh, shrubby grassland. And then this area out here, we have um, the last four nets. Uh, this is a wet meadow, which we affectionately call the swamp because there is standing water. And we have our banding station, so when we capture birds, we return to a centralized location to do all the processing. So, gotta talk about the protocol. 
Okay, so MAPS has it set up so that you collect your data on the breeding birds in your area. And so there's different periods that start depending on where you happen to be. Oops, pointer. Uh, so period one here, period two, period three, period four is where we are. So we start the last day of May, the first week of June. And then once you start, you run it until the end of August. Each period is 10 days long. You choose one day within that 10 day period to mark your birds. You don't wanna do them too often because the birds learn where the, the nets are and they will avoid the nets. Uh, when we did our week long course, we ran every day um, and I think we had a couple of trap happy birds uh, that we caught just kind of over and over. So we start the last week, uh, the last day of May and the first week of June. But everybody who lives in Eastern Oregon, what happens that first week in June? We have stock show. What is the weather for stock show? <laughs> we missed our entire first period because MAPS is very Goldilocks. You have to not have it too cold, too windy, too hot, or too wet. So it's very Goldilocks. And we lost that whole week. We could not get out there. We even tried one day and it was still just pouring down rain. Yeah, you know, because the weather said it was going to, and so. But, so we lost our first week. So we had to make up our first banding during our next period so period five we actually did two bandings and unfortunately for me that was finals week so i got up 3 30 out there helped them zoom back into town gave my final zoom back out there yeah it was crazy um but it's fun so uh so we ran um from basically it was june 11th was the first day that we were able to get out uh, and our last day was August the, the 2nd. So we had a couple of close days at the beginning. Other protocol for MAPS is that you open your nets, and by opening the nets, it means that we go out and um, put our nets up on the poles, and you open your nets at sunrise. And so that's your standard open time. So you have to look through the sunrise calendar and find out when your sunrise is. So for each of our periods, these are the sunrise. So lucky for us, after we hit winter sol summer solstice, we get to sleep in a few minutes. And, and because we open the nets at 530, which means we're on the ground. Usually it was 415 we met or 430 so we could put up our banding station and then we sit there and we wait and we watch the temperature because we have to wait for that perfect temperature. So we wait for five o'clock or the temperature and sometimes it wasn't until 530 because you know how early June can be. It can be quite cool. Protocol also says you keep your nets open for six hours. So the, the standard closing time would be six hours later. So, so we, very early mornings, and I don't know about my banding friends, but on banding days, I never slept well because I always thought I would miss my alarm clock at 3.15. <laughs> and I, so I would show up sleep deprived like the rest of everybody else. But it was always so much fun. We were always very energetic and ready to go. It's like Christmas, you know, you never know what you're gonna get in the nets, it's always an adventure. So being out there in the morning, we have beautiful sunrises. We also can be silly, so we, we do some silly things. But here's Arlene and I setting up a net just as the sun is coming up over uh, the mountain. Notice we're dressed because Arlene and I are so stinking cold natured. Uh, and it's chilly out there uh, as we're waiting for the air temperature to warm up. Also, the other important thing is you have to have warm hands. You can't handle the birds with cold hands because it stresses them out. So we live in gloves. Even in August, I still had gloves and hat on in the morning, so just to keep moving. So uh, as we set up nets, 
So we have 10 nets, as I showed earlier. The nets are 12 meters long, almost three meters high. We place them on poles and then stretch them all out. They have guidelines to keep them stabilized. The mesh is uh, about 30 millimeters, which is about an inch and a quarter, so about yay big is my, our mesh. And you can see here, you can barely see the net, so it's pretty much invisible. And so the birds, as they fly through, uh, will run into it. We also have to be careful because when we're setting up nets in the morning, there's a lot of deer who um, uh, bed down, so we're shooing deers because we don't want deer running through our nets in the morning. Uh, so we run, so once the temperature's right, we run out and we set up our nets. And then once our nets are set up, we check the nets every 30 minutes. And there have been days where we are doing net runs and you never make it back to the banding station. You just pass the birds off because by the time you pluck all the birds out of the net, it's time to run another run. And there was one day I didn't, I was out from the very beginning, set the nets, and the next thing I know it's nine o'clock. And I was like, I am so hungry and thirsty and I have to stop. So we set our nets. We check them every 30 minutes. They stay open as long as it's not too windy, it doesn't rain, or if it gets too warm, we do close the nets. And by closing the nets, we um, pull them down and pack them up. So here's one of our net runs. It's all hands on deck when birds, so you can see that Nancy's, oops, I did it again. One more, there you go. Uh, Nancy's working on a bird here. I have a bird here, so I'm talking to Nancy to make sure I can't start tugging on the net while she, Arlene's working here, Scott and Mike are working over here. So um, when we, we, we move together as a group, and it's like this beautiful dance. So we start hitting the first net, and there might be one or two birds, and so some people stop and say, I'll get those birds, and then the rest of us go here. And it's this beautiful little dance that we do out there. The first year in 2017, we only communicated with each other with cell phones. So if we had a problem, you had to pull out your cell phone, and then you had to think about, where is everybody, will they answer their cell phone if I call? Uh, for the 2018, our beginning year, um, we all had walkie-talkies, so little radio phones, and that was really helpful because they were just on all the time. So if you had problems, you could get on it and holler and say, please come and help me, <laughs> which we have all done. So getting a bird out of the net is a fine art. <laughs> so this is a little lazuli bunting over here, and this is a, a sparrow, probably a song sparrow. Well, the birds fly into it, and you check every 30 minutes, but you know, they, some of them will grab hold of the net, some of them will torpedo themselves in, they'll do everything. So when you approach the net, the first thing you have to do is decide which way did the bird come in. So did it go this way or this way? And you want to pull the bird out. You don't want to push the bird through the net. The first thing I always do is untangle the feet because the feet just make me crazy. So I get the feet untangled and as soon as you get one untangled, it grabs it with the other and you're fighting. And then you can kind of get your fingers in there and pluck the bird out, start working the net over the head. I find that if I get it off the head and then let the bird rest and they flutter their wings, the wings come out. Nancy taught me that really cool trick. Um, and so uh, we get the birds out. And, and so if you have a lot of birds in, there were two, one or two times where one net had 10 birds in it, one net had 14 birds in it, and it's just frantic when you walk up and you're by yourself and you have that many birds in there. Please come and help. So uh, getting, we get the birds out as quickly as possible. And then we place the birds in um, cotton uh, bags. These are made out of old bed sheets. I, I am the seamstress of the group. Uh, and I made all the bags. Uh, ribbons tie them up. At each net, 
is um, a clothespin with a number so when you're, after you get the bird, you put it in the bag, you can grab the um, clothespin and pin it to the bag so you know which net that bird came out of. And when you come back to the banding station, you can uh, put it on our clothesline. And we have our clothesline all the way around the banding station and we kind of move the birds around so in the early morning we can let them be in the sun, but as the day heats up, we put them in the shade. Um, and so it's also nice when you're working, you pull the bird down and you have your clothespin and you pin the clothespin to your shirt so that you remember where that bird came from. And then you have to remember to take the clothespins back. Uh, if you have a lot of birds and you're checking a lot of nets, you can uh, pin the birds back to that guideline uh, while you're um, gathering birds out of the net and then uh, grab everything and then scooch back to home base. So this is what our banding station looks like. It's total chaos. Uh, we <laughs> It is. <laughs> Uh, so we have our canopies to keep the sun off of us and our tables and then all of our gear. Uh, we can, um, we band two birds at the, at the same time and have two scribers going um, on. And so uh, this is one of the quiet moments of uh, when everybody was out making a net run. So I want to show you what we collect. So this is our data sheet. Okay, so maps make us collect lots of data. And the data sheets are terrifying. And so the most important thing is band number and species name. And maps number, number one rule is if you cannot identify that bird, you let that bird go. Because you can't put a band on a bird that you don't know what it is. So that's rule number one. And then rule number two is once you know the bird, the first thing you do is put a band on it because you always drop a bird when you're processing. I've lost a couple, all of us have lost a bird somewhere along the way. So the first thing is you want to put the band on. And the other data that we collect, we, uh, we collect age. And so there's a ton of different categories. And then it asks, how do you age it? Lots of categories. What's the sex of the bird? How did you sex that bird? Then there's a ton of information about the body, and I'm going to go through each of these. Then we also look at molts and uh, weigh the bird and date and capture time and where. So just a ton. So it, and everything has a grade to it. So uh, if you look at the brood patch, you know, what's the status of that brood patch? How much fat does it have? So. I wish I had all this in my head. We have a cheat sheet. I have to still look at the cheat sheet. Maybe one of these days I'll have this whole thing memorized. So let's go through some of the things that we do. So the first thing is that we need to get that band on that bird. And so we need to measure the bird's leg. So this is a leg band measurer and the number on it indicates the size of the band. And then once we decide that, we need to get that tiny band out and read that, how many numbers was that again? Go back and see how many numbers, see how many numbers it is, and read all those numbers to your scribe. And I am so stinking blind, I have both my bifocals and the Optivisor on to read this. <laughs> well, I'm not the only one. So, <laughs> and we, we uh, get that data on, uh, and give that to our scribe, so here's Nancy scribing away. And then we have special pliers, which are just the right size for each of the bands. And then we uh, band the bird. And these holds that you see as holding the birds, these are called the banders holds. This is the first thing that we had learned when we took our class. So we get our bird banded. So now if we lose the bird while we're processing it, it's OK, because we at least know what it is, and it has a band on it. Uh, the next big mystery that we do is we need to age our birds. And aging birds, you can age by looking at the skull. And this is more important in the later part of the summer when you have young birds. Because when birds come out of the nest, they have one layer of bone on their skull as they mature, which can be 
this could be July and this could be October. So it's a pretty fast process. They lay down a second layer of bone. And if you wet your fingers, part the feathers on the head, wiggle it around, you can see this if you're really good. And you have a great imagination, that's what I always say. So here we are trying to do some sculling. So I didn't do sculling early on. I waited till we had young birds because it's more important then. Um, so we do sculling. We look for brood patches. So you hold the bird in your hand, <laughs> blow on the bird and expose their brood patch so you can see if they're breeding. So uh, the brood patch is the in for incubation. So we look for that. Both males and females can have this. So this doesn't indicate that you have a male or a female bird. Um, then we look for something called the cloacal protuberance. This is found in males. When males are heavy laden with sperm, uh, they have a swelling in their cloaca. So now you gotta hold the bird and, uh, and, and look for the cloaca and so you can see the cloacal protuberance right here, the poor little birds, okay. Uh, and this will tell us if it's a male. This works really well on those species that the sexes look similar. So this is helpful. Uh, one other thing we look for is body fat. So the bird skin is so thin, you can see the body fat through it, and there's a gradation of how much fat is on it. Uh, and if I was good, I could do like our teacher showed us, Danny, so you could go and have all the data. I have to go brood patch, cloacal protuberance, fat, okay, I'm dizzy now. And that's what, <laughs> we have lots of fun. Uh, <laughs> it's chaos, okay. So we also take a wing measurement, so we have a special ruler for taking wing measurements. So this is all the crazy data that we're going to be taking. The last of our data is looking at molt. And molt is the scariest part, I think, or the most confusing parts because every bird is slightly different. So we have this cute little diagram that was given to us about how to do molts on birds. So, and we call our bird Joe Bird, okay? So this is the life of Joe Bird. So Joe Bird starts out as a hatchling, and when he fledges, so when he's in the nest, he has his baby fluff on. Just before he fledges, he has his, his juvenile plumage, which we call the Kmart clothes, because this is just enough to get you out of the nest, because you wanna get out of the nest because staying in the nest is dangerous. So get out of the nest, get on your cheap old clothes, get out of the nest. So that's your juvenile plumage. Now, just before they migrate, and we call these birds our hatchier birds because they're born that year. Just before they migrate, Many hatch birds will molt their body and the little pieces on the top of their wings, which we call the culverts. And we call this the formative plumage. Now this is a little bit better, so now we're wearing our gap clothes, okay? Now we migrate January 1st. Now we're considered a second year bird, okay? And if we catch them in May, we can categorize them as a second year bird. He still has all of his stuff, so he still has juvenile wings, but adult body plumage. They breed, then birds tend to molt. Yeah, X-rated. <laughs> they molt, and when they molt this time, they move into all new clothing, so everything's new, so, uh, flight feathers, tail, body, and we call this the basic plumage. And we can call this bird an after hatch year, or we can still call it a second year bird. Um, and we'll get into some of the, the gist of it. Then the bird migrates again, and then when it arrives again, now we can call it an after second year or an after hatch year. 
for most birds that we capture in the spring, we, that we know that are an adult because they're there in, in May and June, we don't have any hatchlings yet, we can just call them all after hatch year birds if we're busy. That's the easiest thing to do. If we have the time, we can get into the minutia and try to figure out uh, the, the plumage and the molts on that. But if we don't have time, it's just as easy just to say an after hatch year bird. Uh, other birds do different types of molting patterns. Woodpeckers are crazy. Um, so we, but this is just the simplified version of it. So let me show you some molts of birds. So we have this lazulite bunting. So you can see that this male <coughs> is losing his pretty blue color and he has brown in it. So is this a young bird that's coming in and getting his formative stuff on? Or is this an older bird? And the other thing you can look for is where. Look how ragged these feathers are. Look how nicked and knotted this is. So this tells me this isn't an adult bird who still is in some of his old stuff. Okay, so he hasn't um, completely um, molted out. So this tells me this is an older bird, not a hatch year bird. Here's a great one. So this is a, a yellow warbler, and she is molting in her uh, uh, primaries, her wing. Uh, when birds molt, they molt their primaries this direction and their secondaries this way. Notice her secondaries are still old and ratty, but all her new stuff is coming in. Uh, here's a great one. Uh, this is a little yellow warbler, and when you look at it, notice all of the culverts over the um, wing are all coming in. See, they're all in little pin feathers, but look at the body. The body is this soft, floofy, downy, baby stuff. The feathers, the wing, and the tail are beautiful. So I'm looking at this kind of bird. It hasn't put in adult plumage here, but it's putting in adult there. So I know this is a hatch year bird, okay? See how scary you think this? Okay. <laughs> and when we don't have time, we don't do this, okay? If we have time, we can go through the minutia and, and write out all of this. But otherwise, we can say hatch year, after hatch year, be done and move on. Um, so I want to show you uh, what we have going through. This is um, a page out of our um, Peter Piles, which is our identification guide. And Piles has tons and tons of information about each species. Notice you've got to flag it so you know where your bird is. And when you read it, it gives you just tons of information about all the different subspecies. I don't care about that. What I'm interested in is reading his information about how can you tell a hatch year from a second year, a female, a male from an after hatch year, after second year. So you read through this, and we have a joke, just reading through this, so you say, Forehead Laura's an arculus brown and buffy, one or two inner, and you read, and it's a foreign language, and we call it Pileus because Peter Pyle wrote the book, so it's Pileus. Okay, so that's that's an inside joke. So here I have a little common yellow throat. I know it's a male because he has this beautiful little zorro on. So I have time. Let's figure out his age. So I I can. Uh, Ignore the female, so I'm here on either one of these. So it says, is, is, your, uh, is the head uniformly brown with blackish modeling, or is it uh, completely black and the eye ring is also black? So notice he has a completely black face mask and a black eye ring. So I know he falls into this category. Um, and I can call him a second year um, an after second year male. Or you can get this, so now here's a younger uh, common yellow throat, and when you look at it, 
and you read about the common yellow throat, uh, here it is, it's showing that it's uniformly brown with blackish mottling. So I know that this is a hatch-year bird or a second-year bird, depending on when I capture it. So if I caught it in August, I know it's a hatch-year bird. If I caught it in May, I know it's a second-year bird. Got it? Are y'all pros yet? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of our group members are very good at this. <laughs> Some of us are not that good at this. And, and we're going across the table. Do you see this? And yeah, uh, so it's pretty fun. OK, so the last thing that we do on a bird is we weigh it. And look, this is a great use for all those film um, tubes that you have. So if you have some, send them my way because we need them. So uh, we weigh our little birds. And this is the time that you lose your bird, because they back out and they're gone in just an instant. And then the last thing we do is we let the birds go, so we pretend we're Snow White, you know, and let the birds fly away. So that's all the data. So every single bird, just a ton of data that we're providing to the MAP station. So what did we get? We need to get into that. So we caught 181 birds uh, during our MAPs. We had 23 different species. The most common bird that we caught was the common yellow throat. Uh, we had 29 recaptures. 28 were birds that we had banded in 2018 and got hunk up in the nets again. One bird, this guy. Okay, that's his picture. Um, we banded as a hatch year bird when he on Lad Marsh. So this was one of the birds that we banded in 2017 during our course. He flew to his wintering grounds, and he came back. Isn't that exciting? We were so excited. <laughs> so his data was at the USGS webpage. So we just inputted the band, and we got the information. So we have one recapture so far. So we're pretty excited because the other 28 don't count because, you know, we just caught them again during the same summer. Um, how we age our birds, 97 of those birds we um, categorize as after hatch year. 44, we were hatch year birds, so lots of juvies. 25, we um, said were second year birds. Nine were after second year birds. And four we called local birds, which were actually hatch year birds, but they're so stinking young that they don't fly very well. All of our little hatch year birds, if they were really small, we carried them back to um, the area that they were captured in so they can be reunited with their parents. And it really stressed us out uh, to have a, a, a hatch year bird. And I wanted to get it back home in a hurry. Um, so what did we catch? Just to kind of give you an idea of things that we caught. We caught mostly common yellow throat, uh, yellow warblers, black cat chickadees, which are the coolest, most tenacious little birds. They get so tangled up in the net, and when you're trying to pluck them out of the net, they find the hangnail on your thumb, and they suck back at the entire time <laughs> that you're trying to get them out of the net. And you're like, really? OK. <laughs> but they're so sweet. So another one of those Snow White moments. We, we have lots of fun. Um, uh, song sparrows, uh, flycatchers, um, epitomax flycatchers, if you know anything about birds, epitomax flycatchers all look exactly the same. Um, and the piles is really cool. There's some subtleties. And we were so lucky one day, at the same time we were processing a willow flycatcher and a western flycatcher. So we got mostly uh, willows out there, but it was lots of fun, so I had to put these two side to side. Um, savannah sparrows, they're so tiny. Look at them. Uh, cedar wax wings, they look like they have fur, not feathers. Lazuli buntings. Lazulis are actually migrating through. We only get lazulis, what, we got them in August. So they're using lad marsh on their way 
to wherever they're going. And because you, when you find lazulites, where do you find them? You find them in the kind of rocky mountain uh, uh, or hilly side. So La the middle of Lad Marsh is not where you're supposed to be using them. So this is important data for uh, ODFW. Um, let's see, we got goldfinches, tree swallows, which have no neck, um, downy woodpeckers, which scream at you the entire time you're processing. Ask Arlene, she didn't like that one. <laughs> um, uh, yellow breasted chats, and just to show you, we call this hole the photographer's grip, so you hold the bird so you can take a picture of it. All the others are in um, uh, Bander's grip. Some wrens, the Fuix and house wrens. Uh, Eastern kingbirds, which are really cute, teeny tiny little orange crown warblers. Icky brown headed cowbirds. <laughs> uh, swallows, again, cliffies and northern rough wings. They have no neck. Uh, and one gross beak that we captured, and one very angry magpie. <laughs> Yes, the nets are, well, the bird was on the ground when we were doing a net run, and it actually jumped up and hit the net, and we got the bird out of the net. Now, one cool magpie story is every morning when we're out there, there is a magpie rookery. What is, what was the last count? It was 400 birds that we saw fly out. And we're like, please, we didn't have our nets up yet. So it's like, yay, okay. And one very grumpy American robin. So just some grumpy birds. So that gives you an idea of what we have captured out there. Um, so this is our first year. So all these birds have their bands on them. We'll be running it again next year to see will we catch anybody that we have previously banded. Uh, just to give you an idea, I'm going to run through these kind of quick just so that you can see at the different nets and a little bit of habitat. So nets one, two, and three are, are riparian ones. So net one was running this way. You can see um, we had, since our first two dates were really close together, we caught birds, then we didn't catch birds. So they probably knew where the net was. But we got a wide variety of different kinds of birds using this habitat. Net two along the creek also running this way, a uh, slow, steady stream, and then again, a wide variety of different birds captured. Net three is this cool one that's running through the corridor, so right there. It had a slow start, but it took off, and again, a wide variety of different birds utilizing uh, this area. Uh, if we get into our scrubby area, we have three nets. This is looking down it. So net four would be here, net five would be here, and net six would be here. Net four, uh, it was kind of hit and miss. It didn't get very many birds. But net five made up for it, and a huge variety of different birds captured in net five. Uh, we figured they're flying through the area maybe, and they got captured. Um, net six, again, a huge wide variety of different birds uh, captured in that uh, scrubby area, so there's net six. Then the swamplands, uh, so net seven. Uh, this was the mosquito area. Uh, the mosquitoes would tote you off. Uh, and one of the things we did, um, our first day, we ran our nets, we ran all 10 nets. We felt so overwhelmed, we decided to do the minimum, which is six nets. So we ran nets one through six for the next two weeks, and we didn't run nets seven, eight, nine, and 10 until we felt a little bit more comfortable. So this was, has, that's the reason why you're seeing zero birds, okay? But it got all kinds of interesting birds. Net eight, again, was not open during um, the 13th and the 23rd. Uh, and this one was our hornet nest. Uh, there was a huge hornet's nest there, scared the crap out of us. But lots of birds captured. Uh, net nine is just a 
on the edge right here. Uh, and again, it was a little slow to start, but notice we got up to 10 birds in that net, lots of different kinds of birds again. And net 10, we thought this one would be cool. I took this picture late in the season, they had already done the haying, so all of this was grass, but it's just this long tree out in the grassland. We figured birds would be coming across, maybe stopping the shrub and then get hung up, but it was not a really go-getter. MAPS protocol does allow you to change placements of net your second year, so this might be a net that we choose to move. I don't know. We'll, we'll all decide what we're going to do. So that's what we're capturing out there and where we're capturing and giving you some pretty landscape pictures. Oops. So other things that we collect, we collect data, which is called effort data. So how much work did you put in? So um, you need six hours of effort um, out there. Uh, so you open your nets, run them for six hours. Uh, and if you have to close a net early because of heat or high winds, then you hope you have enough other nets open so you can make your um, effort. We also did breeding status. So the whole time we're out there from the moment we set up our um, banding station till the time we take down our nets, we have to observe every bird that we see out there, every flyover, every bird we hear, what behavior that bird is, because we're not gonna capture every single bird. And so this gives us a potential. So, you know, uh, cranes flying over are just passage birds. But hearing that meadowlark out there, you're like, mm, why didn't we catch that meadowlark? So we keep a breeding status list. And we also have to do habitat structure assessments. Uh, so we have to do that every five years. And so this gives the um, uh, specific data of the habitat. So maps in general, so we'll just tidy this all up. Uh, they use this information. They write hundreds of peer review uh, research papers, hundreds of reports. Uh, to help understand the, the birds, their relationships, uh, the uses of the area. Um, it also gives us ideas on the survivorship and survivorship of adults and first year birds. Just survivorship is more important than productivity because if you can't survive, you can't produce. Uh, gives us some good information on wintering grounds. Uh, also, what are the conditions of your wintering grounds? Uh, is that where we're uh, losing um, the habitat? And so if they can't survive the winter, then they can't migrate. And what are some of the migration obstacles that they have to go through? And also weather. You know, when we had the hurricanes on the East Coast in September, all I could think about was the number of warblers migrating at that time. And that's what I think about. So those were some of our, hopefully our data will be uh, used for. As I said, this is our first year. I'll come back at year five and year 10. Well, I'll be retired by year 10. Won't I be retired by year 10, honey? <laughs> 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 so I have to thank everybody who helped out on maps. Danny was our fabulous teacher, and she even came out on our first run this year. She lives in Post Falls, so she came out and have helped us. Kathy is the uh, wildlife biologist out at Lab Mars, so she's our station manager. We have Arlene and Scott and Mike and Nancy, the bird whisperer, because she's so good at what uh, just getting those birds out. Trent joined us in 2017, wasn't able to join us in 2018. Nolan is our young guy. He makes fun of us because we're all blind. <laughs> Susan, <laughs> Susan joined us this year. She says she was there for moral support. Uh, we're trying to convince her to come join us. Uh, Aaron, a, a student uh, in biology, came out and helped with data. And the most important person was Steve <laughs> because he brought 
the food truck out every time at nine. Woo! He brought coffee and yummy goodies, so we couldn't do it without him. So he's the most important person uh, out here. Kathy's giving him a bird to release. <laughs> She's not holding his hand. And of course, since this was our first year, we had no gear at all. So we had to write lots of grants and get lots of money. Uh, so I have to thank all of the, the folks who helped out, um, that provided money. The, I, oops, I used some of my faculty scholars. I think I bought the canopies and the tables with that. The Badgley Fund bought all of our nets. The Friends of Ladd Marsh and the Oregon Birding Association uh, bought all the tools for us. And of course, ODFW for letting us use the area. And uh, the Institute of Bird Populations for let, lending us Danny. So that is it. So any questions? And also, who wants to join me next year? We're always looking for more. Yeah, I know Sophia wants to join me next year. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Dr. Mark? Uh-oh. I'm going to defer it to. <laughs> uh, what's your expected return rate? I don't know. What's our re expected return rate? I mean, we, we marked 150 in 2017, and we had one recapture so but you know I read other um, what was that Arlene you just gave us that article what was that one it was 5,000 recaptures but they were in the Atlantic flyway so uh, so yeah I don't know what our expected recapture rates going to be and then how much do these little guys weigh oh how many grams were, did they weigh chickadees were about 10 grams, yeah, so they're teeny tiny little birds. Yeah, the, the magpie was too big for our scale, so. <laughs> we couldn't, we didn't have a little. See, we, we have the film canister, we have a toilet paper roll for the bigger bird. Yeah, we, yeah it's, very, it's very sad for the birds. <laughs> yeah, I'm making fun, yes. No, we don't have, we haven't run into any predator problems. We did have one northern, was it a northern harrier that we had? Um, but that is a problem, um, you know, uh, merlins could come in. Uh, Danny did show us a picture of one of the stations she ran and a deer took a bite out of a bird in the net. It was, <laughs> I don't know why the deer decided to take a nibble. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, luckily we didn't have any predators. Um, since we run those nets every 30 minutes, hopefully, you know, we can chew everything, keep everything away. So, what did you say, Deanna? Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm surprised at the. But the magpies we only saw first thing in the morning, and then we didn't see the magpies again. So, oh, Sophia, you got a question for me? What happens when you get, like, sparrows? They come in, like, sometimes packs of 20, and sometimes they're on the ground, I think, and they'll fly up into uh -huh. a net if something scares them. What happens when you get, like, 20 sparrows in a net? We <laughs> got 14 birds in a net at once, and it was pretty terrifying to have that it was all hands on deck you get on the walkie-talkie and you call for help and everybody else is running a net at the same time but they as soon as they're free they come and help the one of the most interesting behaviors we had like a whole family of common yellow throats and the babies the hatchier birds were all doing help the cat's eating me, you know, the little baby cry. And the adults were responding back to them, and the adults were also in the net. And then this flock of chickadees came, because if you know chickadees, they respond to um, danger. Uh, and they come, and they were just doing their chickadee dee dee all around. I was like, stay away, chickadees. I don't need to deal with y'all, too. And so, but uh, it, it's pretty terrifying when you get that many birds in the net, and you're by yourself. <laughs> That's why we have walkie-talkies. <laughs> oh, 
Anna has a question, right? Or, or, or Karen, I saw. So you judge the age of the bird uh, by the, the plumage. Yeah, plumage. Does that mean that they uh, reach full size very quickly? Yes, when they come out of the nest, um, they can be slightly smaller, but they um, have the adult plumage and you can... Um, no, but I mean the size. Yeah, the size. They're yeah. already full size. Uh -huh, they're they don't much grow full size. Much, uh, yeah. much more. Oh. Yeah, the young birds are so fat and roly poly. <laughs> they don't even fit in our film canister. <laughs> and then Karen had a, a question. I was just wondering if you noticed a difference between whether, like, whether you caught more males or more females. Because I was thinking the females might be all busy nesting. Yes. And that's, that's very true. Uh, in June, when we first start, we're capturing lots and lots of males. If we capture a female, they should be a priority bird because they should be incubating. And so we want to get those processed and out quickly. But yeah, we get a lot of males. And a lot of times, you'll get like two males. So maybe one male was chasing another male off the territory. And you get, we would always have like two males in the nets in the early part of the season. So yeah, they're doing their territorial behavior. But again, we're always looking for somebody to come join us because we want to take vacations. No, <laughs> but if you're interested, uh, let me know. You can come out and do an observation and it's pretty fun, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that in the second year you could move a net or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, am I right in assuming that you're pretty much committed to this spot so you yes. get baseline data? Yes, uh -huh. so we're committed to this area. So we spent a lot of time um, uh, looking over the area, trying to decide where. So we had a field day where we went out and we weed whacked and um, cleared pathways and set up. Um, uh, did you have another question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I know the marsh has a huge variety of birds. Yes. Uh, did, are you, were you disappointed in the range of species you got or happy with it? Or do you, uh, does it matter? I was happy with it. Uh, we always joked um, when we would be walking out, we'd scare up the pheasants and we're like, no, don't hit our net. Or we would hear the um, the uh, uh, a rail or a sora in that swampy land. It's like. Well, if we catch a snipe, what will we do if we catch a snipe, you know? And we go, well, we don't have the bands for a snipe. So, yeah, it, it, but uh, I, was, I was hoping to catch uh, I, more woodpeckers because I was hearing and seeing them. But, uh, and I really wanted to get those metal larks I was hearing all summer. And so, but, yeah, we got nine more years. <laughs> Uh, it looks like our time is up, so if you have other questions, Dr. Mart will uh, probably be here for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You can uh, approach her afterwards, but thank you so much for coming and um, enjoy. And thanks, my, the, the group. I, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs>